Good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? <laughs> good, good. Thank you so much. I see many familiar faces. I'm just curious, how many of you have been here at least once before? Wow, okay. That is fantastic. Thank you for coming and coming back. We really appreciate it. My name is Destiny Jones. I'm the executive director here at the Springfield Museum of Art. This is our fourth in the series of community conversations, building and strengthening civic friendships. And tonight, uh, we are being joined again by Dr. Rob Baker, who will be speaking about the liberal tradition in America. So um, I'm excited for this discussion. Every uh, week, the discussions have been incredibly fruitful, and I leave with lots of ideas to think about. So thank you for being here. I know all of you have been here before, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot because you know what this is about. So I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Rob Baker. But again, thank you so much for being here and part of this civic dialogue. All right. Welcome, everybody. Is that a little loud? Is that OK? Um, so we, are, we had a little half time. Now we're into the second half of our series. So uh, the heat probably kept some people away and all kinds of busy uh, activities this time of the year. But I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad many of you have been to other sessions. Um, and uh, we've had a good attendance in those. And I certainly appreciate uh, the sponsors again. I want to note on the table, you see all of our sponsors. And that's wonderful that they um, were um, interested in this and, and put, put forth her sponsorship. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, what she said was the liberal tradition in America, but really it's about America's values. And um, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, concern out there in, in the population about what Americans believe in, and there's certainly some disagreement about that, I think, in, uh, at the margins. But I think it's important to note, let me just make a switch here. There we go. Um, to talk about uh, a stream of literature that's referred to as kind of the American exceptionalism. America is an exception to the rest of the democratic world for a lot of reasons that we're going to talk about this evening. Um, but the reason this is called the liberal tradition in America is because we're all liberals. Okay, All of us are liberals. I mean, there are some at the margins who aren't, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. And when I say this to my students initially, they're like, wait a minute, no, no, no I'm a conservative. No, 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 you're a conservative liberal, okay? Or you're a liberal liberal. And I want us to understand the significance of that as we go through this evening and talk about what Americans believe in and why I would make the point that we're all liberals, okay? So that's um, what I mean by the liberal tradition in America. Uh, and America is an exception, as you'll see, to the rest of the world, especially to Europe. Uh, and we'll make some contrasts between America and Europe in terms of democracies and what the values are. So I want to ask a basic question, because there's a term ideology that we use all the time that I think has a pejorative connotation for a lot of people. But what do we mean by that term, ideology? Anybody? A study of ideas. A study of ideas. It's not necessarily a study, but certainly ideas are involved. Beliefs. It's another word for a set of values or a set of beliefs. That's all it is, right? Each of us have, has an, an individual ideology, right? We each have a set of beliefs, a set of values that we agree on. But what I want to talk about tonight, I want to, what I want to get you guys thinking about right off the bat is that quest, second question. What are America's values? If you ask any American on the street, hey, what's America all about? What are America's values? You know, what, what do you think the answers would be, number one? And number two, what would your answers be? So take some time, about five minutes or so, talk amongst your group at the table, and come up with what you think America's values are. What are the fundamental beliefs that Americans have that we share, we proudly proclaim, that we might refer to as America's ideology? Okay, so take some time to think about that, and we'll come back and see what you have.
those of you who just arrived, we are talking at our tables about Americans' values. What, what fundamental beliefs do Americans have? So kind of think of some, some of those values and come up with some. Okay, let's, let's reconvene. I know that there are some conversations still going, which is fine. But um, let's, let's uh, see if we can get some reports. What are some values that your group came up with that, that you think Americans would say, oh, yeah, we believe in this or we believe in that? What would you say? Yeah, Claire? On a basic level, we believe that we should all be treated equally and we have equality. We believe in voting for our leaders as well as having freedom for individuals as well as freedom in the press and freedom of speech. Okay, so equality. How many of you came up with equality at your table? A number of you did. Freedom. How many of you came up with freedom or liberty, right? So freedom of the press, freedom of, of speech or whatever, number of freedoms, right? Liberty. Um, other values that you came up with? Well, you mentioned our ability to elect our leaders, right? That's democracy, okay? Uh, I, th I think it's fair to say that most Americans would argue democracy is a good thing. We believe in democracy, although that's, that's a question these days, okay? There is some um, struggle out there with the concept of democracy, but most Americans would say, oh, yeah, we believe in democracy. Other values? Yes? Say again. Yeah, yeah. The mic's coming around. I, I need to wait for that. Sorry. Go ahead, Don. Say it again, so everybody can um, hear. This uh, harkens back to the first session you did with us, but um, we thought that one of our ideals is of an involved citizenry. Yeah, involvement. P people should be in engaged and involved. Good. I think most Americans would would say something along those lines if you asked them. Other other values that you came up with that we haven't heard yet. Anything here? Okay, entrepreneurship, meritocracy, okay. Down, was there another was there a hand up here? Yeah, go ahead. Right here. Yeah, Mike. Uh, Self-determination. Okay, individualism, self-determination. Is that fair? Individualism, we ought to have some determination of our own uh, lives, okay. Anything else you can come up with that you came up with? Yes, sir. Here, here comes the mic coming to you. Uh, following on individualism is unity. Uh -huh. That we come together as, you know, as a citizenry, as yeah. people, uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. We're concerned about community, right? Individualism, but on the same, along uh, sort of the other side of the coin, community. Any other values? Yeah, right behind you, Jessamy. We talked about the rule of law and yeah. uh, equality of justice. Okay. Yeah, rule of law, equality, justice. Let me ask this. Anybody talk about how strong government should be? Like, should government be unlimited? Or should we have limits on government? Privacy would be a limit on government in that sense, yeah. Do you think Americans, I mean, it, maybe they wouldn't come up with it immediately, but do you think Americans would tend to agree that we should have limits on our government? Yeah, go ahead, right here. One of the things that I couldn't believe I was saying but popped into my head was the right to bear arms. Ah, okay. Fundamental freedom. That's, that's a freedom. I would put it under freedom. Right to bear arms, as you say, is, is uh, there in the Constitution, Second Amendment. This idea of limited government is, I would argue, fundamental, a fundamental belief that we sometimes don't even think of as Americans. I would call that constitutionalism. The idea that government should have some limits, and we ought to have some controls on government that are actually set forth in a constitution, if you will, whether it's written or not. Good. So these are all values that I think many Americans would come up with, and you guys came up with them pretty easily. Let's talk about the implications of this, okay? If I was speaking in Europe, or if I was teaching in a European university, I would have to talk about three great ideological traditions in Europe. One is classical conservatism, okay? Classical conservatism. And very briefly, 
It's the defense of aristocratic institutions and privilege. The idea that there are people who are better, who deserve to be at the top. Those who are not there ought to be at a certain level in society. So this idea of stratification class-wise is fundamental to classical conservatism. But fundamentally, it's the idea of wealthy aristocratic privilege. Okay? There are some Americans who I think would argue something like that. But most of us would look at them kind of askance, right? What are you talking about? You know, it's, it's not, it's kind of un-American even, right? Um, whether that exists or not is not my point. It's a belief about whether it should exist, and that's classical conservatism. It has a very strong tradition in Europe. In fact, that's the tradition that we fought against in our revolution, okay? So that's the first a uh, big ideological tradition that is really still strongly believed in by a lot of folks in European countries. Liberalism, okay, classical liberalism, is the middle class attack on this idea of aristocratic privilege and favoring free markets, constitutionalism, expanded suffrage and the right to vote, liberty, okay, that's classical liberalism. That emerged fundamentally in the 18th century, 1740s. We had in, in uh, England, we had the um, Glorious Revolution. Parliament rose up against the monarchy. Uh, that was kind of an early um, manifestation of the writings of some of the classical liberals, and that put it into practice with the idea that, hey, you guys shouldn't have all the power. You know, we ought to have more equality in the society, and we need to have some ability to do some things on our own, and government ought to have some limits. Okay, that's classical liberalism. And then, of course, there's socialism. Okay, socialism emerged when as a as a major ideology on the, in the world. You know, now, yeah, nineteenth century, uh, primarily in the context of what great upheaval. Well, the Russian Revolution came on the heels of it, and it sort of tried to put this into practice. But yeah, it was the Industrial Revolution. So we had all these you know, working class folks, laborers, who were basically being treated very poorly. And socialism uh, became the, the intellectual response to this terrible situation that many people were uh, finding themselves in. So this working class notion of a truly egalitarian society, socially, politically, economically, that's socialism, okay? Do we have socialists in the United States? Yeah, we have a socialist party, don't we? In fact, they run somebody for president every year, in case you haven't noticed on your ballot. Uh, they have a candidate for president every, every year. But most of us, I think, look at um, true socialists kind of askance again, right? Like, wow, really? I'm not so sure. Now, if you think about this, this is really kind of a continuum, isn't it? ranging from aristocratic privilege down to more of an egalitarian system with, with kind of liberalism, if you will, in the middle. So I think it's fair to think of it somewhat as a, as a continuum. But if we, if we think about the context of this and think about these different um, ideas, we need to understand what we believe in, I think, a little bit in this way. First of all, we've been isolated, okay? We've been isolated. By what? What has isolated us from a lot of what was going on in Europe, at least historically? Not so, it's, I mean, we're immediately, we immediately know what's going on now, right? But the oceans, yeah, lots of water isolated us for years and years and years. So it's been difficult for us historically to really understand our ideology and context, I would argue, to recognize that we actually are all the same fundamentally, for the most part. But secondly, we often think of ourselves, I would argue, as not ideological. We don't think of our set of beliefs as an ideology. It's just America. But it really is not only an ideology, a set of beliefs. It is grounded in which of those classical traditions? Liberalism, right? That's why I would argue that we're all liberals in that sense, OK? Europeans, though, have seen us more clearly for who we are. So a lot of the writings in the literature of American exceptionalism are actually 
European authors. One of the first ones was Alexis de Tocqueville, who came to America. He, he was a, scho a French scholar. He's a French guy. And he was a young guy. He was doing his dissertation on uh, penal systems, prison systems. And he convinced his dissertation committee to let him travel to America in 1832 to study the nascent American penal system. So they approved that, and he was all excited to go to America. And he had a buddy named Gustave de Beaumont. He said, hey, Gustave, let's go to America. You want to go? We're going to go hang out in America. He said, oh, yeah. So they went on this great adventure in America, ostensibly to study the prison system that was emerging in, in the criminal system, criminal justice system. But what he ended up doing with Gustav was go all around the country, the emerging country at the time, and writing about everything that he saw. And wrote one of the most significant works on the American system ever called Democracy in America. Have you read sections of Democracy in America with Tocqueville? Yeah. Um, and he really saw us for who we were, at least at that point. James Bryce is another example of this. He was Lord James Bryce. He was in the House of Lords in Britain. In, and uh, he wrote later in the 19th century, in the 1880s, uh, a book titled The American Commonwealth, in which he was fun fundamentally fascinated by how much emphasis we tended to put on equality in America compared to his experience, which was Britain, right? Uh, and that just was weird to him. So uh, he was writing about how we seem to be um, kind of different in that sense, and he was fascinated by that. So I want to talk about another scholar here, and I want to focus a little bit more of our conversation on some of the ideas that you guys came up with. And this is a scholar named Samuel Huntington, who's in the American exceptionalism tradition, but he is not a European. He's an American scholar from Harvard. He wrote a very important book titled American Democracy, The Promise of Disharmony. And in that, he asked the question, what is the American value system or ideology? And he called it a creed, okay? A creed is just another word for a belief system. And he said, what is it that Americans believe? You came up with equality, right? Liberty. You guys came up with that easily enough. That's usually the first thing that somebody would say. Individualism. You guys came up with that. Constitutionalism. And democracy. Okay, so I want you to take just a few minutes uh, at your tables and think about how there are tensions between these values. What tensions exist, for example, between liberty and equality? What tensions might exist between individualism and equality, between uh, constitutionalism and uh, liberty? So think about the tensions that might exist in our creed for a few minutes and we'll come back and talk, okay? By tensions, I mean how they might, you know, be in opposite, uh, opposite to each other, oppose each other, right? Okay, let's, let's reconvene. I love it. I'm hearing laughter. I'm hearing conversation. I'm hearing some joy in terms of having these discussions. So that's, that's wonderful. Uh, and I've got some harder work coming up. So this is sort of the easy stuff. All right. <clears throat> this is the easy stuff, I think. The hard stuff comes later. So where are the ten? Well, first of all, you look at this creed, right? Equality, liberty, individualism, constitutionalism, democracy. Obviously, what does that sound like? It's, it's liberalism, right? It's classical liberalism, ultimately and fundamentally. That's what we believe in. That's the liberal tradition in America, okay? But there are tensions between the values that we share, you know? So what are some of them that you came up with where these, these are in opposition to each other, potentially, some of these values. Can you, can you think of an example? Yeah, back here, is there a mic? There's a mic coming your way. We have to say that the constitutionalism says, we the people. We the people cannot be individuals. We the people cannot be equal if we're not 
part of the Constitution and the democracy. Mm -hmm. And we, the people, have to show liberty and justice to others and be able to respect what everybody does and says in order for everybody to enjoy the, the fruits of the Constitution. For example, like she said, the right to bear arms. Yeah, we have the right to bear arms, but we also have the responsibility to do it the right way to protect the equal and liberty and justice of other people in the world and yeah. in our community. Yeah. So every single one of those cannot stand alone. Yeah. They have to all lean on each other because the bottom line is we the people, yeah. not me, myself, and I. Good. I mean, you, you talked about how they're all kind of in tension with each other, right, in, to some extent. Very good. Other examples of where we might see some tension between the values. I think one's pretty easy, but, but uh, let's, let's see what you came up with. Go ahead, back here. Um, the Constitution was meant to be a living document, and so when you look at the right to bear arms, they had muskets that had to be reloaded. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about that and you compare that to an AK-47, uh, it's not the same thing. Um, so there's some tension in, in looking at that constitutionalism with the individualism of right yeah. to bear arms. Yeah, that, that is a, a certainly a tension, right, between constitutionalism and individualism. That's a great example that you came up with. Other tensions? Well, the Union Bill, right? That yeah. Was, there's, there's, there's Hang on. See, the live stream needs to hear you. There's a sense to which um, the very perspective that she gave comes out of the spirit of democracy, right? Mm -hmm. True. But, but, but at the same time, there are other voices who would disagree, right? Right. right. And so that also creates that tension yeah. within constitutionalism, right? In the so spirit of democracy, Within the spirit actually. of democracy, yeah. right? Right. Fair enough. Other tensions that you see, that you notice here? Yeah, Mr. Fett. So it seems to us that the individualism and equality are kind of in tension at the same time as well. Yeah because we want to be able to get whatever we can get, and we want it to be ours, not distributed equally. Yeah, that's certainly a tension, individualism and equality. There's another one, kind of similar, that is really fundamental. Anybody, any other examples that you came up with? The first two are really in tension with each other, equality and liberty. Just do a thought experiment here. Let's say we had total equality of everything. What does that do to liberty? Pretty much ex exacerbates it, right? What if we had total liberty? What does that do to equality? Squashes it. I mean, that's a fundamental tension in our ideology between equality and liberty. And I would argue that that's one of the most important tensions that undergirds American politics is that distinction between liberty and equality and the tension that exists between those two. Fair enough? Does that make sense? Be because if we had everybody being equal, then our ability as individuals to be free to do what we want is totally undermined. On the other side of the coin, if we were totally free to do everything we want to do, some people would run roughshod over others and equality goes out the window. Yeah, And that, I think, undergirds a lot of uh, the debates in American politics. Should we have more equality versus, I mean, I think people implicitly understand, certainly many people explicitly understand that more equality kind of, kind of um, you know, undermines liberty to some extent for some people in the way they think of their freedom, right? And vice versa. Yes, question right here. Um, get, get a mic. Yeah. I was going to say that's where the, um, I think the French kind of equalize those two by putting brotherhood in there. But. Fair enough. Yeah, very good. There's more of a community orientation there with the French. Yeah, I like that for sure. Well, this is the easy part. Are we are we ready to move on to some harder stuff? <laughs> All right, let's let's do that. I think there are some also some dilemmas that um, Huntington talks about with regard to our creed. First of all, this is this is really profound. I think no government can exist without some measure of those things. Hierarchy, inequality, arbitrary power, secrecy, deception, patterns of subordination, even the most democratic system has to have some of those things, okay? In America, Huntington argues, and I think it's a powerful argument, our government is legitimate 
to the extent that it reflects the basic principles of our creed. And it's illegitimate to the extent that Americans believe in the creed. The more we believe in it, the more we think we're not living up to it in some instances. Okay? I think this is a real dilemma for us. So what do we do? Well, he argues that we respond in cycles, either as a public in general or different groups of society kind of respond differently. What are the options according to him? Well, he said it depends on how clearly we perceive a gap between what he calls ideals, our ideals, and our institutions of government and society. That's what the IVI gap means, right? A gap between our ideals, our beliefs, and our institutions. And he says if you think about how clearly we might see a gap, we can, he divides this, and I did this, he didn't do this, but we could say, all right, we clearly see a gap between what we say we believe in and what's going on out there. Or we cannot see it. Maybe we don't see a gap. Yeah, things seem to be fine to me, right? Juxtaposed to how intensely we believe in the creed. And we could have this high intensity of belief in the creed or kind of a low intensity of belief. Um, he was talking about groups or Americans in general. That was how he was writing this. I would argue, though, and we're not going to do that right now, but I would argue that you need to think about this. Well, I guess that's kind of preachy. Uh, <laughs> perhaps you would question yourself as we leave here this evening. Where do I fall here in terms of how clearly I see any sort of gap between what we say we believe in and what's going on and how much I believe in this stuff? But for, for um, Huntington, if you combine these things, one way that we might respond is we, we, we clearly see a gap and we have a high intensity of belief, so we tend to moralize. So, oh, something needs to be done about this. We're not living up to our creed. Oh my gosh, look what's going on out there, right? So we have that approach. Another option is we say we highly believe in the creed, but we don't see any gaps. He argues that that's a hypocritical perspective to take, okay? Another option is, eh, we have a low intensity of belief, but we kind of see a gap there, but who cares? Sort of a cynical approach, right? Or we don't really have a high intensity, we have a low intensity of belief, we don't really see a gap. So he argues that that's complacency. So here's the hard, are you with me? Here's the hard stuff. Discuss these. Number one, can you identify historically when America in general or large groups of Americans were in those boxes, okay? That's the first question. But the hard one, that's probably the hardest one. The one that's a little harder because it gets a little touchy is where would you put these movements, okay? Black Lives Matter, Proud Boys, Blue Lives Matter, MAGA, All Lives Matter, Every Town for Gun Safety, NRA, Unite the Right, March for Our Lives, Colin Kaepernick, there he is again, and hashtag me too, or you. So spend some time. Number one, can you think historically where we might uh, place Americans at different points in time in, in uh, Huntington's boxes? And I'll put them back up for you because the, the slides are on your table. You can refer to those. But then where would these groups go? Which box do you think they would go in and why? Okay, go.
just a little, um, just a little nudge here on number one. Even Huntington doesn't come up with a lot of good examples for all these boxes. Okay, so do the best you can, but really move on to number two. Where do you put these different groups that we know of today? Right. Okay, let's reconvene. Um, kind of hurried you along there, but, but I'd like to uh, uh, kind of move along a little bit here. Can we, can we think of periods of time when large groups of Americans or America as a whole was in any of these boxes? I'll put that back up again. I'm, what, what's that? I'm doing, going too fast? Oh, too hard. <laughs> now, this, this would be interesting. Yeah, back here is an um, um, answer. I, I thought about the United States in World War I and getting involved or not getting involved. Mm -hmm. And it was an incredibly difficult time. Yeah. And, and also for World War II. And as Karen said, if it wasn't for uh, Pearl Harbor, Yep. Who knows if the United States would have gotten involved in that. Where do you think we were with World War I, generally? Which box? By the way, I don't know the answers to this. You know, I, I, don't, I mean, I have some ideas, but, but Huntington doesn't even have all the answers here. Where, where would you put America? As the, as the entire country, I'd say it was intensity of belief was unclear. Yeah. I, I would tend to agree a there. Lot, a yeah. significant number of people, and there was no consist, um, consensus. Fair among enough. the populace okay. for that. Yeah, good, thanks. You had an idea? Uh, here's a mic coming your way. <clears throat> Considering the World War One and the time that that age of the world was, I would call that one more of a complacency mm. because they didn't really know what was happening in Europe and by the time they got information it was weeks or months later. And so people in the United States were doing their own thing and just in their own bubble. So it wasn't so much as not knowing, as much as not understanding. So I think the more it was more complacency mm -hmm. for that time. It's a good point. Can you think of some other periods of time? Here's here's a an answer up here. <laughs> Did you have an answer, Don? All right. So we kind of thought that if you take the period right after the Second World War, mm -hmm. we had Let's say the 50s. Yeah, okay. moralism. Because we had done the right thing. Yeah. It was kind of clear that we had done what was right and the, and the intensity of belief was high. Yeah, right afterwards. I think into the 50s, I would suggest maybe we were in complacency box. Okay. Okay. Um, but right afterwards, yeah, moralism. What about, let me give you some examples. What about the civil rights movement in the 60s? Where, where, would, you, where would you put those people I, I in I want to say that after World War II, I don't know that it was more, as much moralism for everybody as it was hypocrisy for most people because those of us of color got left out. Fair enough, yeah. And that is what stemmed the civil rights movement mm -hmm. is the fact that our people, my father included, fought for this country and came back to nothing. Yeah. We were treated like we were less than human, and that was what we were treated like from the, from the very beginning of time. We were brought over here against our will, made to do things that y'all didn't want to do, meaning that those slaveholders, mm -hmm. and then we were treated worse after we were given our freedom because we got to be so-called equal but we weren't really equal, and we still are not equal. Right. So I think the hypocrisy of it is the fact that everybody was unclear, and everybody had high intensity in their own groups. Yeah. So there was so, a lot of hypocrisy. Yes. A lot of hypocrisy, leading up to the civil rights movement and during the civil rights movement. That was the opposition to the civil rights movement. 
those who were engaged in the movement, though, where would they be? Moralism. They're like, oh my gosh, look at America. It's not living up to its promise, certainly in regards to equality, right? Let's move along, because we are running out of time, and I want to do a couple of other things before we go. Let's go to these more recent groups and see where you, where you line them up. What about Black Lives Matter? That's, that's an easy one, right? That's moralism, right? You understand why that's easy? I mean, they think, what? Something needs to change. Now, there's some discussion about what that something is, but nevertheless, it's related to criminal justice, it's related to police, et cetera, et cetera, right? What about hashtag me too? It's more, that's moralism, right? What about, what about um, blue lives matter? That's an interesting one. I heard hypocrisy. Why? <laughs> I'm, I don't think I'm answering the question you just asked. Except for the people who truly believe that blue lives matter, that's moralism for them. I believe. Well, it, blue lives matter. Was that a reaction to something? Well, or? yes. Yes, it yeah. was. That was a reaction to Black Lives Matter, right? Yeah. Right. Blue Lives Matter would never, Blue Lives Matter would not have happened. It was Probably a response. Probably not. Not to the extent that it is. To, and and I, yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. Because if you, you know, if your son or daughter or spouse was a police officer, and you were concerned about the backlash, mm -hmm. even if you were an officer of color, I could see that, you know, there's a real, that one's a real hard one, hard call. I, could, I don't have a pro problem putting Black Lives Matter in the moralist mm -hmm. group, but Blue Lives Matter, I think, is a little squishier. Fair enough. What about All Lives Matter? All, what about All Lives Matter? I need to, uh, I want to add something to that. Yeah, go ahead. To go what ahead. she said. I agree with you, the Black Lives Matter movement is definitely a moral issue. The Black, Blue Lives Matter, to me, is a question because if all police officers were, were doing the duty that they were sworn to do, that wouldn't be an issue. It would not be an issue. Their lives do matter to us, mm -hmm. and the fact that they are there to protect us is paramount to us being safe in this United States. But there are those very few sour lemons in the bunch that make it bad, and that's why other people say blue lives matter, because those few people that got attacked by people who want them to be better keep screaming, everybody's good, everybody's, all the, blue, all the blues are good, all the blues are good, but they're not. Just mm -hmm. like every human being is not always all good. Sure. So I think that's a big question in the United States that really is never going to be clear until there truly is equality. Yeah. And there truly is um, a way for people to be held responsible for their personal actions and their personal choices, no matter who they are or what, they, what part of society they're in. I think that's the issue. Okay, fair enough. There's a point over here, uh, Wes. What about All Lives Matter? Where, where do you put that? I just want to say that Blue Lives Mattered until January 6th. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, Blue Lives Matter was another question. Inconvenient. Yeah. Because what happened was those who were primarily proclaiming Blue Lives Matter, many of those folks were involved in attacking the police at the Capitol. That's the point, right? Is yeah. the, like, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, is that a reaction to Black Lives Matter trying yes. to move us to complacency? Well, if we it could be, yeah. Yeah, fair point. I would argue well, that it seems like you've kind of come up with this on your own, but All Lives Matter is in the hypocrisy box, right? Of course All Lives Matter. But what are you not seeing when you say that? Gap. Yeah. Right. The gap in terms of how some people are being treated in America. 
Um, what about MAGA? Didn't get to that one? This is, you, you can ponder this when you leave, too. You know, it's not, you don't have to just, oh, I'm done with that one. Okay, when's the next one? Uh, let, let's move on, because I, I, I want to do one more thing before we do leave, and I'm going to spend about another seven minutes or so. Yeah. Yes. The question was, can we put MAGA, Proud Boys, and Unite to Right sort of in a group together? The answer is yes. They all kind of believe the same thing. Um, and they're, they're basically um, not seeing where the, where the gaps are, right, in terms of America's values. All right. I'm going to skip over Lewis Hartz a little bit here, but basically Lewis Hartz is another American in the American exceptionalism tradition, and he argues that our revel Americans largely were born free in the sense that we fled uh, uh, clerical and, and uh, religious and um, other types of oppression, uh, white Americans who came, not black Americans, okay, and women were not uh, given um, political power in the United States until 100 years ago. But those who founded the country, he argues that they were born free in the sense that we didn't have a traditional revolution. So he asked the question, was our re revolution uh, a traditional revolution in the sense that you overthrow something and put something brand new in place? And he argues that really we had a revolution that was to protect our tradition of liberty that we brought with us and that we were trying to claim. So was that, are, are we liberals or are we conservatives, he asked. And in that connotation, his argument is that we were actually conservative in the sense of trying to protect something, but not in the classical conservative sense of, arist of preferring aristocratic privilege. We were trying to preserve our liberal norms, okay? So I think is an interesting argument um, that um, I thought I wanted to share with you in terms of uh, just quickly here before I uh, move along to a couple of final points. So the implications of Hartz's ideas. First of all, um, there's a great potential for intolerance in America, not recognizing that we are fundamentally all liberals uh, and not, and, and sort of thinking that we're non-ideological or not even thinking about our ideology, which means there's been a lack of fertile ground in America for other ideological perspectives to emerge as solid alternatives. We've got them. We've got socialists. We've got some classical conservatives, but they're, they're largely fringe, right? Most Americans look at those groups as kind of oddballs. Um, and I think that's because of the liberal foundations that we've got. That's Hartz's argument, right? Finally, he says, because of these this um, grounding that we've got in this classical liberal thought, there's a little bit of a potential for lack of understanding in America. And so he has this quote, can a people that is born e equal ever understand peoples elsewhere that have become so? I think that's pretty profound to think about. It, it suggests some reasons for why Americans sometimes have a lack of understanding for other countries and also a lack of understanding of, of, of uh, people who are trying to do some other things that are different from what we're doing. But with that in mind, I would like to show about a one minute video and then I'll end the session, okay? Hopefully this will work. See if you can click on that. What holds us together is a creed. Well, now that I said that. And so one of the things that I feel like it's really important for us to do as Americans is just to renew that creed through rituals, simple rituals. I pledge to be an active American. I pledge to be an active American. To show up for others. To show up for others. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to serve and push my country. When right to be kept right. When right to be kept right. When wrong to be set right. Wrong to be set right. Wherever my ancestors and I were born, whatever my ancestors and I were born, I claim America. I claim America. Congratulations, folks. You are now sworn again. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us again. So that was Eric Liu, and he is the founder of Sworn Again America and the founder of Citizen University. He was a policy advisor to the Clintons 
to the Clinton administration in the late 90s before the 2000 election. And once he left the Clinton administration, he and his wife and some others founded these organizations. Thinking about the naturalization ceremonies that new immigrants come to take when they want to become citizens, and thinking about how important it is to maybe for all of us to think about what we believe in, what our creed is, and maybe to actually swear an allegiance to that creed. So that's how we came up with this idea of sworn again America. So I ask you to stand and join me in swearing to our creed if you'd like. I pledge to be an active American to show up for others, to govern myself, to help govern my community. I recommit myself to my country's creed, to cherish liberty as a responsibility. I pledge to serve and to push my country when right to be kept right, when wrong to be set right, wherever my ancestors and I were born. I claim America and I pledge to live like a citizen. Congratulations, you're sworn again. Have a great evening. One final thing. We have two more sessions. Next one is two weeks from tonight. Professor Tom Taylor is going to be talking about polarization and the rule of law. And then four weeks from tonight, I'll be back to talk about gerrymandering. Okay? So thanks for coming. Spread the word. See you guys next time. Um, two, two quick things. Um, on your tables, there are flyers for the Big Read. It kicks off this Sunday, correct, Amy? So we, um, we are a Big Read community, um, and it's being led between the museum and the Clark County Public Library. There are several different events that are happening, and we hope you'll join us in that. Um, we're reading Fahrenheit 451. It's in conjunction with an exhibition that we currently have. In addition, there are flowers by the front door that we have from an event over the weekend. And if anyone would like to take some beautiful flowers home, please grab some on your way out. Thank you.